Seeds. I'm assuming most of you, uh, if I skip this other thing, <laughs> send them our list because we're being fun. So look beautiful, everybody. I'm assuming, let me just see by a show of hands, how many of you have heard me speak before? Okay, the majority, but not all of you. So for those of you who don't know me, as Kendra told you very correctly, my full academic um, background is in anthropology, which is a study of different cultures. Because I focus on what we call a historiographical approach to anthropology, you're going to hear a lot of history. And the history will illustrate the mythology, and the mythology will illustrate the history. Okay? And as Kendra mentioned to you, I also focus on what we call the colonial period. That is the period known um, by some historians as the Renaissance. I call it the early modern period. That would be from the late 15th century to the end of the 18th century. These are the times when the world opened up. We had the great voyages of exploration. We also had a rather horrible Spanish Inquisition. We had persecution of Catholics in England and the destruction of Ireland. We had persecution of Protestants in France. Uh, we had persecution of Jews and Muslims. We just had persecution. And we had the colonization of the New World and the Pacific. And the Pacific was essentially seen as an extension of Spanish colonization of the New World. By the time the British get into it, which is already late, it's the 18th century, some of you may have heard the name of Captain James Cook, that's already very late in the colonial sweepstakes. So what I'm going to do with you, because I do focus on that this particular time period from the end of the 15th to the end of the 18th century, looking at the legends and the history to give you a background which fleshes out that time period for you, I'm going to do a combination of cultural studies and history. So we're going to be batting back and forth, okay, between mythology and history. I do see a value in mythology beyond just pretty stories. They are amazing stories. They are amazing narratives. And storytelling is an art. And storytelling is important. That's the way the human heritage was preserved for thousands of years. And beyond that, the storytelling, as you will see, of the indigenous peoples also serves to give us a counter history. European written history is one form of history. There are other forms as well. One is not better or worse than the other. They are different. Now, let's begin. Mythology of the South Seas. And Kendra, thank you very much for your beautiful PowerPoints, because these PowerPoints also will serve to illustrate and make much clearer what I'm going to say. You can begin by asking question, why is the Pacific called the South Sea when we know that the Pacific goes all the way up to the north by the Bering Strait in Alaska? Well, blame Spain. <laughs> I do tend to understand for most of them. So why do we call it the South Sea? Because in 1513, on September 18th, one of the Spanish conquistadores, Las Conuñez de Balboa, Balboa as you call him, saw the sea for the first time. Was it the first time the sea had been seen? Hell no! We know that the Polynesian navigators, who by the way were the world's greatest navigators, that is not my opinion. That's the history of cartography and navigation. It was the Polynesians of the people from Southeast Asia who sailed the greatest distances that had ever yet been traversed um, prior to the age of exploration. Balboa had never seen the, what he would call El Mar del Sur the South Sea. And because he had come to what we now call Colombia, this is the early 16th century, he's part of a whole colonization attempt by Spain and Portugal to take over the New World. But Balboa develops a slightly different attitude towards the native peoples. He actually begins to respect them. And in fact, he respects them so much that a very nasty group of conquistadors, the Pizarro brothers, who will later go on and conquer what country? Peru. Peru. Will have him executed. Because they thought he was soft on Indians. Okay, so he 
Even among the conquistadors, we're going to find we have individual differences. They all start out badly, most of them end badly. Some of them actually change. And I think Balboa is one who did change. He really begins to respect the native people's knowledge and their knowledge of geography. And they form very good ties with him. And in the part of Colombia that we now call Panama, because it just was Colombia until the very early 20th century, um, he was led by some of the native, uh, the native peoples, and they showed him the existence of this gigantic sea that he had heard rumors of. And because the Atlantic was known, and it was called by the Spaniards El Mar del Norte, right, the Sea of the North, what better reason than to call this El Mar, El Mar del Sur? And that's why you call it the South Seas, right? And some of the great American authors by the names of James, James Michener, have you ever heard of him? Yeah. Sort of a magnificent collection dealing with the stories of World War II, tales of the South Sea Islands. Right? That was when he was a real writer, before he started writing all those crazy epics that have dinosaurs mating for 100 pages. <laughs> and he's some of the Centennial. Did anybody hear of the Centennial? Or get the, the hun first 100 pages, two Brontosauri mating. Or something. <laughs> but before he did that, he wrote very great stories of where he served in World War II, in the South Pacific. That's why it's called the South Pacific. <laughs> okay? So there is no correlation between its its uh, geographical placing on the map, and north or south. But it will forever after be called El Mar del Sur, thanks to the Spanish conquistador Calderon. The first time Europeans have contact with the Polynesians, it is going to be in the early 16th century. And it's going to be a rather weird contact, because you see, when they discover for Europeans, the Pacific, they were discovering an area that was already perfectly traversed and mapped by Southeast Asian and Polynesian sailors for over 3,000 years before. You might not know this, but the first human settlement in, in Brazil comes originally from Southeast Asia. So when we look at the oldest fossil ever found in, in Brazil, um, and it's funny, her name is Lucia, and that's funny because we know the oldest fossil found in Africa, or one of the oldest, now it's not the oldest, it's called Lucy oh, yeah, in Ethiopia. So people seem to like that name because the findings have nothing to do with each other. But Lucia um, had DNA which linked her to the peoples of Vietnam and Cambodia. And she's one of the earliest people who ever settled in Brazil 14,000 years ago. What is that telling us? It's telling us that a certain part of what we now call the Native American population, which has a very rich and interesting heritage, actually comes from Southeast Asia. Okay, so they were crisscrossing huge distances. And they were crisscrossing them in the gigantic outrigger canoes of the Polynesian and the Southeast Asian peoples. We'll get onto the, onto the outrigger canoes later on, for now, you've got to remember the name Avendaño, Alvaro de Avendaño, who is another Spanish conquistador, who in 1567 will set sail from the port of Callao in Peru. Callao has the same meaning in Peru and the Pacific Coast that a city like Port Royal would have in the Caribbean. Pirates. Lots of pirates. And this is why Spain becomes interested now in this big ocean. Because you see, until the end of the 16th century, the king of Spain, and the king of Spain at that point, Philip II, used to call it Mi Laguna Española. Mi Pequeña Laguna Española, my little Spanish lake. Sort of imperial. <laughs> well, there are other imperial powers on the way. One is Great Britain. And Great Britain can't yet fight Spain one-to-one, -one, but they can send corsairs. What is a corsair? Tell me, anyone. What's a corsair? You want to say a paid pirate? Well, yeah, yes. Okay, so a corsair is essentially a pirate with state backing. So Queen Elizabeth I was no idiot. She's not going to confront Philippe II because he's got a much bigger armada, or at least he had a much bigger armada until 1588. 
So she's not going to confront them in the 1560s with her kind of puny little English armada, but she can confront them with her pirates. But because they have state backing, they're not called pirates. They were called corsairs. Now, in English, we say that the type of state backing that those people had was letters of mark. But in Spanish, the term actually reflects the word corsair better, and it's patente de corso. And that's where the term corsair comes from. So Elizabeth starts to attack Felipe in the Pacific, and who was her most famous corsair, pirate, man of adventure? Before Sir Walter Raleigh. Oh, yeah. Say the name, Diane, I just heard you say it. Francis Drake. Say thank you, Sir Francis Drake. Right? Another very famous red haired pirate. Okay, there's a thing about red haired people in the second part of the 16th century. Queen Elizabeth Tudor was a redhead. The famous Irish pirate queen, who she would later become friends with, Grace O'Malley, was a redhead. Francis Drake was a redhead. <laughs> Sir Walter Raleigh was a redhead. This is getting ridiculous already, okay? So redheads have a very important part at this point. So Felipe Segundo is angry because his ships are now getting attacked. What ships? What ships are the Spanish sending into the Pacific? Well, you tell me. What's the country in Southeast Asia named after this very arrogant Spanish king? Felipe. The Philippines, right? The Philippines. So, the Philippines. He'd already conquered those islands. And now there's a galleon going back and forth. It's called the Manila Galleon. From the Philippines to Acapulco. And then from Acapulco... The gold is taken all the way down to Panama, where other gold comes up from Peru. And that gold is taken to the Caribbean, and of course we know the pirates attack it there. But the pirates were also attacking in the Pacific. And so Avendano goes off with letters from the King of Spain to make sure, as Felipe said, my little lake stays in my hand. This is the background for the meeting between the peoples of the Pacific and those of Europe. And you can tell that those of Europe are not really looking at the peoples of the Pacific as equals. They're kind of just in the way. We'll see what happens with that as we go along. Okay. So it's very easy when we start talking about colonialism for me to say wonky wonk to Europe. I often do say that, but I guess I also have to, I also have to say wonky wonk to other civilizations too. Because while Europeans may have excelled in imperialism, I can't tell you they invented it. Long before any of Spain or Portugal's or England's armies arrived in the New World, there were other conquistadors and imperialists who were from the native civilizations of the Americas. Because people are people everywhere, and they act badly to each other everywhere. And so the first conquistadors were those of the Inca Empire. Now look at the map that we have for you here. The Kendra very nicely selected. It's a beautiful global map. And can you see the Spanish galleons, right, in the Pacific? But look over here, and thank you, Kendra, for reminding me. There's a core here, or else I would have gone flying. So the Inca Empire, Kawantin Suyu, in Quechua, land of the Four Corners. We know the other land of the Four Corners up here in the American Southwest. That's a common Native American term. <coughs> the Inca Empire has a huge seacoast. And the Incas, who were the great imperial force in Latin America prior to the arrival of the Spaniards, were also interested in overseas empire. The Incas had conquered a huge area in South America, and they also wanted to extend their empire out into the ocean. They were not afraid of the ocean. The Aztecs in Mexico had a land empire, and they were terrified of the ocean. The Mayas in Central America, they're a real pirate group, they still are. The Mayas had no problem attacking the Aztecs either from the Pacific or the Atlantic base. And the Maya 
had huge outrigger canoes that were very similar to those of the peoples of Southeast Asia. So the Maya had no problem with the sea, and the Incas definitely had no problem with the sea. And in the year 1470, we have the most notorious Inca conquistador. And folks, he was no nicer than any of the conquistadors sent by Spain, and his name was Tupac Yupanqui. And Tupac Yupanqui, welcome, come in. Tupac Yupanqui, in 1470, inherits the throne of the Inca Empire from his father, Pachacutec, and he is interested in what's out there because on a little island, which I'm not even going to dare to locate on this map, have you heard of Easter Island? We're going to be spending quite a bit of time there soon. That was called by Tupac Yupanqui, Abachumbi. Okay? And there were messengers and merchants who would come from Abachumbi, and another small island right next to it, which we know the Incas called Nina Chumbi, <coughs> and they would bring gold, and they would bring, listen closely, black slaves. Now we know this because when the Spaniards conquered Peru, and we know that Spain brought its black slavery with it, guess what they found in Peru? You already had black slavery, but the black slaves were from the South Sea Islands. Now were they black? If you've ever seen somebody from Micronesia or Melanesia, the skin is very, very dark. They are not African. Now, obviously, to a Spaniard or to an Inca of the 16th century, they wouldn't have made those differentiations. Slavery, unfortunately, existed in practically every society on the planet at that point. It was a worldwide disease. But we know that Tupac Yupanqui, who was a king, who was an imperial king, and just like Philip II in a later period, uh, was interested in expanding empire. He had no problems with slavery. Unfortunately, kings usually don't. And so he leads Inca armies out into the Pacific. Now, when the Spaniards conquered Peru, they already heard the stories of Tupac Yupanqui's feats. And many of the early Spanish chroniclers wrote them down, because of course Spain will later be interested in conquering the same rooms. And supposedly Tupac Yupanqui, but we know now not supposedly, Tupac Yupanqui sailed from Peru on a type of boat which was made out of reeds which you can still see floating up and down Lake Titicaca. And the first time people see it, when they go to Bolivia, they say, wow, that looks like a Viking boat. He's a very famous Norwegian anthropologist. We'll see later when he was young and quite a hunk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't usually go for Scandinavian. I don't know, I did not have pushed that in the kitchen. <laughs> Who also said the first time, that looks like a Viking boat, or he said it in Norwegian. Um, those boats not only sail across Titicaca, they are ocean-going boats, as Thor Heyerdahl would prove later. And the Incas sent a fleet of, according to the Spanish chroniclers, over 4,000 of their sailors and soldiers out into the Pacific, and they conquered what we now call Easter Island. Is there pre-Columbian Incan Easter Island contact? Well, prior to Thor Heyerdahl proving to the world that there was, everybody said, nah, the Incas probably couldn't sail. Then we run into problems because when you do archaeology on Easter Island, guess what? You will find walls that are Inca walls. Now when I say Inca walls, the Incas had a very specific building style. Has anybody here ever been to Ecuador, Bolivia, or Peru? Wow, you all better go. Really good. <laughs> so you know the Incas were the great builders, right, of the southern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere up here, it's the Mayans and the Toltecs and later the Aztecs. And the Incans built massive monolithic walls, huge, massive monolithic walls, with a specific style because the Incas would not use any mortar in between the rocks. They would just fit it. Guess what? There are Inca walls on Easter Island. Beyond that, the story that the Easter Islanders tell definitely harks back to the Incas. On the islands, there is a place that the native people, called the Rapa Nui, call the Canal of Tupac. That's not Tupac. Tupac Yupanqui. And they tell a story of the people they call Hanan Epa, which means long ears, coming and conquering them. Now, why is that very significant? The Inca, 
called themselves Long Ears because when the king, whenever an Inca emperor was inaugurated, the first thing they would do was drill both of his ears, pierce both of his ears, and put in heavy gold spools. So that was also the sign of the Inca sovereigns. So put two and two together, Thorir, that I'll ask people to do. They tell of a king called Tupac. They tell of being crushed by the long ears. That sounds like Inca colonization. But you see, 20 years ago, if I said that in an anthropological forum, I still would have been shouted down. And they would have said, oh, you're a follower of that crazy Norwegian anthropologist. Yes, I always have been. And yes, now it, everything that Thor Heimdall said has really been proved beyond the shadow of a doubt. And how do we know that now? Guess what? Through DNA. DNA is a wonderful way to shut people up. <laughs> All right? Because the DNA of the Rapa Nui Islanders is mixed with, as we've seen from the beginning of the lecture, the peoples of Polynesia, some of the peoples of Southeast Asia, apparently the Vietnamese and the Cambodians were sailing those seas, and DNA that is identical to people in the highlands in Ecuador, Bolivia, and Peru. End of story. There's a certain amount of racism that used to be, I think, very prevalent in my field, which is anthropology, before Thor Heyerdahl exploded it, which just said, oh, the native peoples. No, no, they were all isolated. You know, native peoples didn't sail anywhere. Folks, if you even read the Spanish Chronicles, you know that's nonsense. Because when Francisco Pizarro, the conquistador of Peru, came down from Panama, well, he didn't write anything, he was illiterate. But his nasty brother, Gonzalo, and his nasty cousin, Pedro, wrote about meeting ships filled with native royalty. You know Pizarro wasn't writing that because he wanted you to really care about Native American culture. That was totally not in his mind. He was writing, he was writing it, Gonzalo Pizarro and Pedro, and Pedro Pizarro wrote it because they were chronicling what happened. Yes, the native peoples were also seagoing. The only group that was not with the Aztecs. Maybe when we talk in another session, maybe next semester, about Aztec cosmology, we'll see why the Aztecs are so terrified of the sea. But actually, with the exception of the Aztecs, every native culture in Latin America was also Seco. Remember the term Rapa Nui? That is the way the inhabitants of Easter Island refer to themselves. Otomantua. Say that quickly. Five times. <laughs> right, very good. I won't wait to say five times. Otomantua is the great culture hero of the people of the South Seas. And his legends are first recorded for us by Spanish priests from the 16th century. Where was he from? Well, considering the fact that the Maori people, have you heard of the Maori people, right, of New Zealand, with their magnificent carvings and sculptures, and you know the word tattoo? Okay, so the Maori are of course those people who have brought tattooing to a truly artistic level. For the Maoris, every Maori's personal history is expressed in tattoos on their body. Extraordinary, extraordinary tattoo art. Well since the Maori have a story of somebody named Potumantua who sailed away and never came back, and the Rapa Nui on Easter Island have a story of somebody named Hotumantua who suddenly arrived from the far west. I think it stands to reason we are talking about the same culture figure. This should show you, again, how extraordinary their arts of navigation were. You're talking about huge distances. And the stories jive, okay? And I say that because <coughs> both the Maori and the Rapa Nui had a very long oral tradition, although I must tell you the Rapa Nui also had writing, which we cannot decipher now. The Rapa Nui were not an oral people. Not every culture in Latin America was oral. And by the way, we even know now from research done in Harvard by Gary Erton that the Inca Kipus were also, those are the knotted uh, chords the Incas made to record supposedly only numbers, we know now they were also phonetic. So it turns out there may have been an Inca system of writing. But if the oral stories of the Maori and <coughs> the stories 
both oral and written, which you can't read anymore, but the oral stories of the people, uh, the Rapa Nui people, jive on this, I would say we could surmise that Hotumantua was a historical figure. In terms of the generation count, he is placed in what would have been, for us, the 10th century. Okay? So we are in the Middle Ages now, in the Pacific. I want you to try to extend your concept of the Middle Ages from out of Europe. Of course, it includes Europe. It includes the whole world. Okay? So the Middle Ages for Southeast Asia and Polynesia were a time of tremendous discovery. Europe will begin to get into its discovery during what we call the Renaissance, much later. But these people were going huge distances. So Hotamantua, who was Hotamantua? Okay, probably he was Maori from New Zealand. <coughs> was he a survivor of a cataclysm? There is a story which is told by the Maori of New Zealand and by the Rapa Nui in Easter Island, which, by the way, Easter Island, to what country does it belong? La Isla de Pascua, it is part of Chile. Okay, it is part of Chile now. The story is that an advisor of Hotumantua, listen closely because I'm going to connect this to the Incas, dressed as a bear, okay, a shaman who could change form, comes in the form of a bear and tells him that his native country, called Piva, is going to be destroyed in a huge cataclysm. Now, why is it important that his shaman comes dressed as a bear, or in the form of a bear? Interestingly enough, in Inca tradition, up in the mountains, in Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, we have a figure called the Ukuku, which is Quechua for the bear shaman, who was the kind of mystical advisor of the Inca emperors. That is too much to be a coincidence. And so we definitely have a lot of cultural confluence in the centuries before the Spanish conquest, and even before the Inca conquest. So Otomantula takes this warning seriously, and he sends seven advisors out to find a new land. And they go out over the ocean, sailing for them due east. Okay? Imagine these gigantic Polynesian outrigger canoes. And they sail to the rising sun. Remember this quadripartite division? Okay, east, west, west, north, south, as you have in the American Southwest. And the Hopi and the Diné, the Navajo people, call this the land of the four quarters. The Inca called their empire Tawantin Suyu, the land of the four quarters. Suyu is a quarter in Quechua. The east is always the, the, um, the direction identified with the rising sun and with Genesis and with rebirth. So this will be where Maori culture, to a certain degree, will be reborn, although we'll see it, it will also change in Easter Island. So they sail into the rising sun. <clears throat> and they find this place called, well, they called it Rapanui. And that's what the people of the island still call it. And they say that when they came to Rapanui, there were beautiful forests. The whole area was covered with beautiful forests. But you know, by the time Spanish conquistadors and English pirates showed up on Easter Island in the period we call the early modern period. If you want to be nasty, you can still call it the Renaissance. There were no trees. That area had been completely deforested. So what had happened? What had happened because what Europeans found when they came was a population that was completely divided into two warring groups. And both of the warring groups told the same story of a horrible civil war. Now go back to the earlier slide. Remember we spoke about the arrival of the Long Ears? Apparently there was a huge war between the Incas and the Rapa Nui. At one point the Incas won, at one point apparently most of them were chased out. But the island remained divided, and part of the consequence of the division was deforestation. 
Now look at the Moai. Have you ever seen these gigantic images? You may have seen them in National Geographic documentaries. The Moai. These, thank you so much, these huge statues, which represent, and we'll talk about this in greater detail, the ancestors. These huge statues which are raised on platforms have to be moved on rolling logs. Now, can you all see that in the slide? Okay, you'll see down here, people moving the statue on rolling logs. But this constant process of erecting the moai is going to deforest the island. What could that have to do with the wars that were fought on Easter Island between the Incas and their followers and the native people? Could act just like the Spanish would act later on. We have endless processes of imperialism, just as Spain's armies would do in the New World. If you wanted to put a people down, you have to deforest where they live, because then you make them completely dependent upon you. Okay? When you deforest an area, okay, you may not have visited Peru yet. Has anybody here ever visited Spain? One, oh, I have two, three. Okay. If you go into central Spain, in the area of Spain called Aragon, Aragon, you will walk through what looks like an absolute desert to you. Why? Because when the king, Felipe II, was ready to send his Spanish Armada against Queen Elizabeth in 1588, he literally deforested all of Aragon to the bishops. And Aragon never recovered from it. There was also the way Felipe made the Aragonians, who still had a slightly separate identity, more dependent on the dominant force in Spain, which was, of course, Castilla. Castile. If you destroy a people's living space, you make them dependent on you. This process was probably started by the Incas before the Europeans show up. So we've seen everybody in the Anastasia colonials. Isn't that wonderful? That possibility is open to you all. Did Hotamantua bring the idea of the Moai? Well, the legends say that he did, and that he brought the, the idea of the Moai and taught the people how to build the Moai, together with his wife, whose name we don't know, the legends don't tell us that, but they do tell us she was the one in charge of construction. Strong name. Um, he, the Moai represented social control. The Moai was the ancestor. And when the Moai was finished, notice the Moai in, in the slide, they do not yet have eyes placed in them. But it was a very elaborate ceremony, which is now conducted symbolically by the Rapa Nui people in Easter Island, of the placing of the eyes in the Moai. The eyes are made out of obsidian rock. If you know a little bit about particularly Aztec culture, obsidian, right, that volcanic black stone has a tremendous symbolic meaning. Obsidian is what slices through obstacles, which can also slice through the people. It is an object of the all-seeing. You know, there's a lot of nonsense that you may have heard in grade school. The native peoples had no mirrors, you know, until the Spanish showed up and showed the mirrors. The native peoples had mirrors all over the place. Hmm? Nobody less than Hernan Cortez speaks about Aztec obsidian mirrors everywhere. So obsidian was the mirror. You polished obsidian. If you've ever looked into a piece of obsidian, it is a perfect mirror. The eyes represent the mirrors of the soul, and they are animated by a force, remember this name, mana. Mana is that great spiritual force in the South Pacific. It's a very important word for people from the Pacific Islands. When you watch people from Hawaii do the hula dance, the hula dance is done to tell the stories, the sacred stories, and summon up the force of mana, the spirit force. When the statues have the eyes placed in them, they are illuminated by that spiritual force, mana, and then they watch your moral actions. So, putting the moai up on the aku, okay, that thing is called aku aku, it means a sanctuary. It's also the title of one of Thor Heyerdahl's best books, where he writes about Easter Island. You know the name of his first book? You've probably heard of it, Kantiki. 
And he writes American Indians in the South Seas, and his third and I think final greatest book is called Akuatu, and it's all about Easter Island. When it is raised on the Aku and eyes are placed in the Moai, it then becomes the ancestor watching your moral actions. Is this Hotomanto a surviving colony? I'm going to dare to say yes because the legends fit. Were there trees there? Yes. How do we know that now? From geological analysis. Now it's not even an issue of legends jiving with each other. This island was hideously deforested at the end of the 15th century. That fits perfectly with the time of Inca Camaros. And remember that policy, scorched earth. The British would do it in Ireland. Spain did it to its own people. Philip II would do it to the Aragonians. And of course, Spain and Portugal did it all over the New World. England would also do it in the northern part of the New World in the 18th century. The US would do it in the West in the 19th century. Russia did it in Siberia. China has done it in Tibet. Okay, this is a horribly effective way of making people dependent on you. And you can belong to any political ideology you want. It would be nasty. The head, this is an amazing picture, look at the moment, mm -hmm. literally walking, <laughs> walking out to sea. This is one of two places in Easter Island where the Moai face the Pacific. In most of Easter Island, the Moai, these great statues of the head, face inland. Why do they face inland? Because they are supposed to watch your moral actions. Why do these face out? I'm going to give you a hypothesis, and I'm not sure, but one hypothesis that we have is that these Moai would have been turned by the Inca themselves at the end of the 15th century to emphasize the dependence on their empire, on Tawantin Suyu. Because this is very strange. The Moai generally always face inland. Now notice these Moai have no eyes. Who would have taken the eyes out? That was probably the Inca as well. The Inca had a very, very powerful religion, just like the Spanish would have when they come. And the Inca worshipped the sun, Inti. This, for the Inca, would have been idolatry. Some of the Spanish will say that about the Inca's religion later on. And so it is possible that these statues had their eyes removed. That would be taking the power from them. And the Incas would have been very well aware of that connection between the eyes and the spiritual force, mana. They would have been very aware of that. <coughs> you understand here that this is a strange orientation. When Thor Heyerdahl first saw this, Heyerdahl was very unusual as an anthropologist because most anthropologists until Heyerdahl generally didn't listen to what the native people said or rather, they listened under their own interpretation. Heyerdahl said, if there's nothing supernatural in the story, I think we can probably consider it oral history. And what they told him, what the Rapanui people told Heyerdahl, <coughs> was that these Moai, like all the other Moai, had walked out to sea, but that there was nothing strange or magical in the way they walked. And Heyerdahl said, OK, explain that to me. And the people said, we can't because we no longer have trees. OK, bingo. Heyerdahl began to put two and two together. He literally had to import logs into Easter Island from Peru, where he was based. And together with the native peoples, he began to conduct experiments listening to their stories, because the native people said, we made them walk on trees. Now, you know, earlier anthropologists have heard that, but oh, these crazy native people and their funky stories. And I would also know, if you're saying it's not magical, it's not magical, show me how it was done. So we will see how the Moai eventually will walk. Now, first let's understand this concept, which I mentioned, mana. And here you see an example of a Moai. By the way, the term Moai in Rapa Nui literally means grandfather. So these are your ancestors. Here you see a Moai with the force of Mana placed in him. Mana for 
the peoples of the South Pacific, enters through the eyes. Only in the case, the people say, that a person is blind, does mana enter through the ears. So the eyes, and in the case that the person is blind, the ears, are the spiritual portal of this strength. Who has mana? Well, I, mean, I think in Western culture we would call it charisma. Okay, this kind of force of personality some people appear to have. Mana is both hereditary and acquired, and it can be lost. So this is interesting. Do not compare this to the idea of divine right of kings. If you're a peasant, and yes, there were class differences in the society as there were in any, you can acquire mana through acts of personal valor. But you can lose mana by acting like an idiot. <laughs> okay? So if you are unethical to people, if you violate the rules of good conduct, which apparently was done in their civil war, which I'm going to tell you was done in any people's civil war, then you lose mana. And if you violate the rule of conduct, ethical rules of conduct, and you lose mana, you cannot acquire it. So do you see it kind of, a kind of as a form of, you know, in the West we have things like the Ten Commandments. This is also a way of guiding people's behavior. <coughs> and the Moai, of course, here you see, is where the soul resides in the stone. And here you have a really strong connection with Inca and Andean philosophy. Because when you go to the Andes, you will find that literally every rock is sacred. The Waka, the holy site in the Andes, is the rock who is your ancestor. And the stones in the Andes are alive and they are animated by your ancestors' spirits. They do not believe in a dead universe. Think of, actually, physicists would tell you this as well. You look at a rock, you see a rock. But when a physicist looks at a rock, he understands there are a million neutrons and electrons and protons and everything else. He's zipping around in that. Nothing is stationary. That table is not stationary. I know that from physics. So this idea of the living universe is very strong, and the sanctity of the rock and the stone, because these are rocks, big ones. This is something else that ties the people of Easter Island with the peoples of Peru and Ecuador. Why did they stop building the Moai? Either the Incas stopped them, or the resulting civil war between those who followed the Incas and those who opposed, those who opposed them ended it. We can't, I, can't, I tend to blame Spain for a lot of things in the colonial period. That one I can't blame on the Spanish. That was not, that was not, I can blame lots of things in Mexico and Peru on them. This had stopped before Spain's imperial armies got there. Well, doesn't he look charismatic in there? Well, that's an Inca conquistador. Not any nicer than what Europeans sent later. So, Tupac and his father, Pachacuti, were conquistadors in every nasty sense of the word. And don't think they were any nicer, because they were not. And the proof of that is the very ugly memory, of, particularly of this emperor, that remains in Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. When you say his name in Peru, for half of the people descended from the Inca, the Quechua, he's a hero. But go into another little valley right outside of Lima, called Huarochiri, and say his name, and you will hear cursing like you have not heard in a very long time. He barreled through, he conquered, he was very merciless, and yes, he probably was the source of that civil war between the long ears and the short ears, as it's called uh, and in Easter Island, the long ears being the Incas and those of the islanders who chose to follow them, and the short ears being those who opposed, who opposed them. As long as you refer to the invading Inca, there is nobody else to can refer to. Do we have rooms of Inca military outposts on Easter Island? Yes, we've identified up to now nine different sites. That's interesting because Easter Island is not so big. But when the Incas conquered an area, just as their successors from Spain would do later, the first thing they would do would be to establish military outposts. Why? You have to control the population. <coughs> so we have that, and then we have a blind period 
1534 to 1722. Why do I call that a blind period? Well, up until 1534, Rapanui, or Easter Island as we now call it, or Lesa de Pascua as we call it in Spanish, was connected, whether it liked it or not, to the Inca Empire. What happens in 1534? That ends the Spanish conquest of Peru. Now this is Spain. And the Inca ships no longer arrive on Easter Island. Nothing comes. And so there is this long, blind period from which we have stories which unfortunately were not well preserved by the first anthropologists because they did not give enough historical credence to oral tradition. So that is called on the island the blind period. Can you understand the importance of calling it the blind period? If you remember mana enters through the eyes, okay, please think of that. I want you to try to think in the terms of the native people. So that's really a dark period in their history. <coughs> Some light comes, but it's not, not going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> okay. So, when you study colonial history, many times Spain, when it does not want to admit what it did in Latin America, is like, it's la leyenda negra. That's the black legend they created about us. We were really wonderful. We just came for a picnic with the man. <laughs> Got a little out of hand. One of those parties on a Saturday night. Oh, that's not true. They were horrible. And, not both. So were the English, so were the French, so were the Dutch, and we just saw the Inca were no picnic either. Right? So colonialism is ugly. And colonialism, as it will be with the Dutch, is also horrible. Sometimes in American history, I think we have a stereotype of Dutch colonialism which is a little too benevolent. Right? We always say the Dutch believed in religious freedom. Plenty of individual Dutch too. But Holland was one of the biggest slave trading powers wow. in the world. And in the early 18th century, Holland's slave trading actually surpassed, was close, England, Spain, and Portugal together. Okay, so to view the Dutch Empire as benevolent, no. Ask an Indonesian. And you might know about it less because the Dutch did more of what they did in Indonesia, and you don't live in Indonesia, we're in the Americas, so we're more familiar with the English and the Spanish and the Portuguese. I want you to understand that Dutch colonialism was every bit as horrible. And in terms of slavery, the Dutch colonialists, I'm not trying to insult anybody of Dutch background, everybody in world history understand one rule, everybody sucks. <laughs> and everybody was involved in that game. But at that point, it's Holland leading the fray. And so the peoples of Easter Island fall prey to the process of slavery. And this is going to begin a horrible depopulation of the islands. And now I have something even uglier to say. I would love nothing so much as to tell you in the 19th century, we had our independence in Latin America. I'm saying we because I'm an Argentine now. If you push me to a wall, I'd like to consider myself a citizen of the world. If you said there's one country you have to choose with all its mess, I'd probably would say Argentina. What else I have gotten for my soul? So I'd love to tell you, after independence, everything was wonderful. Was it? No. It continued to suck. And unfortunately, independent Mexico, what did Mexico do when it became independent? It sold the Mayan Indians into slavery. It's called in Spanish, La Guerra de Castas. Ooh, that was wonderful. What did Peru do once it became independent? Well, we've got no slaves left here. San Martin has abolished slavery here. Let's find them in the Pacific. Okay. So you see why I tell you that humanity has a long way to go? Because there's too often this attitude of, I don't want to be a slave, let me enslave somebody else. As opposed to maybe get rid of slavery per se. So I will say what was really hard for me to say when I was 20 years old, because I saw things much more black and white, but now I have to say that every independent government of Latin America has been just as horrible as Spain to its own native peoples and to the peoples of the Pacific. And if you know me, you know I just said something really harsh, <laughs> okay? But that's the sad truth. And it will be Peruvian, independent Peruvian slave ships that go out 
and now find slavery from a new source. And that will almost depopulate the population of Easter Island. Ugly, ugly stories. That was horrible. The population of Easter Island at its lowest point when it was decimated by the Peruvian slave ships went down to 200 people. So it's kind of amazing that there's anybody left standing. What is extraordinary is that these 200 people, once, um, once Peru finally abolished slavery, which was abolished in Peru earlier, but not for Pacific people, once Peru finally got around to being a little bit more consistent with not practicing slavery, the Rapa Nui people slowly began to build themselves up again. As I speak, there are around 30,000 Rapa Nui, which is amazing and I think wonderful that they're still here. And the Rapa Nui people preserve the historical memory, which is extraordinary, and thankfully was preserved for us by Thor Heyerdahl, who took them seriously, which we already know now a lot of early anthropologists did not. When the Rapa Nui Renaissance, here I think we can use the term Renaissance, okay, um, begins <coughs> following Heyerdahl's work with them in the 1940s, one thing Heyerdahl encourages them to do is to write down their story. Now, you know, as an anthropologist, that was difficult for him to say because as an anthropologist, you don't want to alter the culture. And the culture at that point was strongly oral. But I think Heyerdahl was right because he said, look, you're living in a world now where everything is written down. If you don't write it down, it won't be taken seriously. Please, for the sake of your culture, write it down. And it turned out to be the most wonderful thing he could have said to them because there was literally an outpouring of beautiful literature coming out of East Island. Um, one of the major figures is Hina, the fire goddess. <coughs> now, if you visit Hawaii or any place in Micronesia or Melanesia, you will hear about Hina. She is a benevolent goddess. And that's interesting because fire gods sometimes are a little... You don't want to have coffee with them in a Starbucks. But she is nice because she, like the goddess Pele, not the Brazilian soccer player, the goddess Pele in Hawaii, she watches over the volcano so they won't explode. <coughs> Why is this important? The water is not going to. Why is this important? Because, I'm going to say something really facile, volcanoes explode. <laughs> but you also know the Pacific is the famous ring of fire. And there have been hideous eruptions Tambora, about 70,000 years ago, and in written recorded history, what's that famous eruption that created 10 years of night from Indonesia to Liverpool? Krakatoa. Okay. We know that in Japan, there are parts of Japan that have sunk due to volcanic explosion. So you want the fire goddess on your side. Okay, this makes sense. Hinduism has another famous god, goddess Shiva Parvati, the god goddess of destruction and regeneration. You want that person on your side. In Mexico, we have the cult of La Santa Muerte, okay? the blessed death. Why? You want her on your side. You want death coming when you're ready for it, not when she just wants to show up. So many cultures develop an attitude, I think this is interesting to consider, so it's being afraid of the forces of death, cultivate them, become friends with them. Because you're going to want them to show up one day quietly when you're sleeping, <laughs> not when you're wide awake driving down the highway. Okay? So Hina is reborn in their literature. Now I mentioned to you they had writing. Well, they do. And we have many, many examples of the writing called Rongo Rongo, which is a crazily frustrating thing because we can't read it and we can't decipher it. But I want you to be optimistic because for over 400 years, people said we would never be able to decipher the Inca Kipus, the strings of knots. And it took 400 years, but now we have a great mathematician in Harvard, Gary Ayrton, who is doing that. I have to brag about you, but I was invited to a conference where he stood. John I think I was sharing the bathroom. Gary Irving 
<laughs> so, what I want to point out to you is that a lot of times these forms of writing and communication, as we've seen in the decipherment of the Inca Kipus, are based on mathematics. The Inca Kipus, how did Gary Erdman come to this? They're based on a binary system that he was using in computation. Gary Erdman had nothing to do with Latin American culture. Somebody handed him a replica of the Kipu, and he just started reading it as though it was a binary code. So it were a binary code. So it is possible that the Rongo Rongo writing will be deciphered. Gary Erdman is too busy working on the Inca Kipus to work on this, but other people are, and I think we should be optimistic, because the problem was, um, Many times Native American forms of writing would be given to specialists in history and literature to decipher. They can't, because writing systems, you know this if you've ever studied linguistics, are based on mathematics. So you need a computer specialist or a mathematician to decipher. So I am optimistic if we've seen the um, progress we've seen with the Inca Kipus, we hope that the Rongo Rongo writing, because there are hundreds of wooden place with this writing preserved and we desperately hope it will be designed. So, what really produces the renaissance of the Rapa Noe is a really good looking Norizo. Yeah. <laughs> it really looks like a fire person. If you don't know him, he's one of the greatest figures in 20th century anthropology. And in Latin America particularly, we love him a lot. Because it was Thor Heyerdahl, who almost alone for many years fought against what we now know is a stupid idea and has been totally disproved that the native cultures had no contact among each other, that they were all isolated, that native peoples cannot sail here and sail there, and the natives were this and the natives were that, and he totally exploded that. And so we love him a lot. And he lived to be 94. That particular picture of him is when he finished the Gantiki expedition, and he was a hunk. He was a hunk. I'm looking older than that too. I would have given him a thumb. Take a little sweet today. Okay. So let me tell you about Iron Man. When he was working in Peru and Bolivia and Ecuador, of course, like any tourist as well. He had to see the world's highest mountain lake, which of course is Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, <clears throat> on the border with Peru. Amazingly beautiful. And as I told you, when he was watching the Euro Indians, as they're called, sailing their boats back and forth across the lake, he freaked out. They look like Viking boats because they have the dragon heads and everything. And he was fascinated because, as he always pointed out to everybody, he apparently was from a kind of aristocratic Viking lineage. You can see that in his face. And he was very, very anxious to learn about the sailing techniques of the peoples of the native peoples of the Americas. And he heard their stories that they had gone out to the South Seas. He had read the Spanish Chronicles, which corroborated the fact that native peoples had sailed the South Seas. And he believed their stories. And he said, if you will help me, we're going to launch an expedition, and I want to prove that your boats what looked to me like these Viking boats going back and forth on Lake Titicaca, they can sail across the Pacific. And you know, the native peoples were moved by this because, I mean, all they heard from Europeans prior to Thor Heyerdahl was, eh, hey, crazy stories, blah, blah, blah. Or you're making up stories that you can sail large distances because the Europeans sailed large distances, blah, 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 blah. Heyerdahl believed them. So what he did was to reconstruct those boats. And he set sail from the port of Callao in Peru on one of those boats, followed by two others. And they will manage to sail on those ancient boats from, where do they go from? Peru, directly to New Zealand. They get that far. Okay, understand this. That proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that these boats are ocean going. And yes, the Incas could have conquered Easter Island, and yes, these were not just stories. What did he call the name of his famous boat? <laughs> <laughs>
Kantiki. Okay, why? Because one of the ancient pre-Incan gods of Peru, who was still worshipped by the people on the coast, the Nazca Indians, is called Kam, the god of the water. So it's a good thing when you're setting out in a boat to have the protection of the water god. And Tikti in Quechua is a word used for sacred food for the gods. So Kam Tikti, kind of accept this offering, water god. This is more than just Thor Heyerdahl doing a kind of survival thing, saying, hey, look, I can do it. What he was proving, and you have to understand this, is why I'm whacking on about him so much. This was what completely changed the field of anthropology. From a fairly racist field in which cultures were classified according to how white Westerners thought they had gotten far, to a field where the culture is accepted and respected for what it can do. And when he proved that those boats could go as he went, from Peru to New Zealand, they were ocean-going boats that destroyed about 150 years of stereotypes in anthropology. Okay, so, gracias for. He also proved, he proved many things, but one thing he also proved, and this might not seem like a big deal to you, but it's a big deal in Latin American archaeology, there were chickens in Peru and Ecuador prior to the coming of the Spanish. Now most of you probably do not wake up at night and say, were there chickens in Peru? <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't strike you as a major thing. But this is also part of the mythology Thor Heyerdahl was exploding. Yes, there was contact between the peoples of Polynesia and the native peoples. Yes, they sailed back and forth. Let's not say, Heyerdahl said, that all this contact just began when we Europeans showed up. It was going on long before. And he should know because his own ancestors, the Vikings, wrote about meetings in ships with the native peoples up in Canada, up in Ungava Bay. Some of you call that. So, how did he prove there were chickens? Well, like any good anthropologist with a training in archaeology, he came originally from archaeology, digging in Easter Island, he found chicken bones. Digging in Peru, he found chicken bones. And he had the chicken bones carbon dated. And they went back to the 12th century, which was the 300 years before any Spanish conquest. They were trading chickens. By the way, the name Atahualpa, you've heard of him, the last Inca emperor, one of its meanings in Quechua is literally the clucking chicken. <laughs> okay? And this is also one, one aspect of exploding that myth of non-contact among the native cultures. Sweet potatoes. Now this one is particularly important. The word, the Quechua word, the word the Incas used and 10 million people in Peru use when they speak Quechua, because Peru is not only a bilingual country, people, 17 languages are spoken in Peru. Quechua and Spanish are the two official ones, and Peru recently has had to wake up to the fact, oh, guess what, it's got other people too. There are 17 languages spoken. And in all of those languages, because the Inca imposed it, the word for what you call a sweet potato is kumai. Well, guess what? When Thor Heyerdahl was sailing, Viking-like, his ship from Peru out to New Zealand, he was stopping in various ports on the way, and what did he find? In every single island, when they offered him sweet potatoes, what was it called? Kumar. Okay, how did that Quechua word get that far? Probably that Quechua conquistador, Tupac Yupan. Let's talk about tattoos. People have weird attitudes. So I had a co-worker a year and a half ago. You had that co-worker too, Andrew. We had a co-worker who was rather paranoid about tattoos. Which is kind of stupid in Arizona, because I've got to say, you people have a lot of tattoos. So if one state I wouldn't pick to be wonky on tattoos, it might be Arizona. Folks, I mean, I, I personally don't have tattoos because Actually, in Jewish tradition, and I'm a Sephardic Jew, we're not supposed to have tattoos, so I don't have tattoos. But I got no problem with people who have tattoos. Uh, and the reason, by the way, we don't have tattoos is because supposedly we were tattooed as slaves in Egypt, so 
Okay. But I have no problem with other people having tattoos. You can also eat pork in front of me. <laughs> um, one thing is very important for anthropologists and I think people just to know is that tattooing is a very ancient art of history. Okay? So the tattoos, particularly of the South Sea Islands, <coughs> and don't confuse it with taboo. I'm starting with tattoo, we'll get to taboo. The tattoo is the recording of the personal history. Okay? And so by the time a person dies, they have had their personal history engraven. This is a form of writing. I want you to try to extend your definition of writing beyond just the names. And tattooing is an art. And the art of painting the body, these were permanent tattoos, is a very ancient one. Um, so I would just ask you, because a lot of times, you know, we have preconceptions and stuff. And some of the weirdest people that I know don't have tattoos and wear pinstripe suits. So. <laughs> don't always judge a person. Now I'm saying that because that is a preconception. We've got to get rid of those preconceptions. The word tattoo is a Polynesian word. And what it means in Polynesian, interestingly enough, is told story. Because that's what your tattoo is. It's your told story. Wearing your history on your sleeve. There's another word that comes to us from the Polynesian language. That word is taboo. And that word first comes into any Western language when Avendaño, the Spanish conquistador, sails out in 1567 from the port of Callao and encounters that word among the native peoples. Taboo is what is prohibited. Now, tattoo is taboo. Okay, many later, in this case, Protestant missionaries, uh, particularly those who get to Hawaii, if you know anything about our U.S. colonization of Hawaii, it's a very nasty story, apart from really repressing native culture there. Um, the U.S. also prohibited for many years the people of Hawaii to have tattoos. And, you know, if I can give you my equivalent, that would be like telling me as a Jew that I cannot read the Bible and I can't read the Torah. That's my history book. I have to read it. When you tell a, South, uh, a person from the South Seas, from the Pacific, that they cannot tattoo, you are destroying their, their transmission of history from generation to generation. You, you are erasing historical memory. Okay. So yeah, we, the U.S. also has an ugly history. Well, if you, anybody here can find me a country without an ugly history, I'm going to. Rebirth of the tattoo, when the U.S. finally made it legal again for people in, in Hawaii to have tattoos, the people of Hawaii really took this seriously because it was horrible for them to not be able to transmit their own story. And instead of just kind of enclosing in upon themselves, they wanted non-native non Hawaiians to understand this. And so I think it's particularly interesting if any of you ever visit Hawaii, I had that pleasure once in my life. Um, it's extraordinary to see the renaissance of Hawaiian culture as well, and the Hawaiians are very anxious to share this culture. So you can be a white Hawaiian or a black Hawaiian, and you're also part of this whole ethic. Uh, and don't forget the hula dance before it's danced by beautiful young women. You know, traditionally, the hula dance is supposed to be danced by a bunch of heavy set older men. <laughs> it's really quite funny if you ever see the actual hula dance. The tattoo comes back in the Hawaiian people, particularly, you know, bring it back with a vengeance, but not a nasty vengeance, okay? A good vengeance, I would say. And people, if you walk down a beach on any of the Hawaiian islands, everybody, black, white, Hawaiian, mestizo, is tattooed all up and down, okay? Before you judge it, understand. Like I said, I personally don't have tattoos. I have no problem with it. It's a form of recording history. The power of dreams. Okay, so when we understand the cultures <coughs> of the Pacific Islands, we have to understand the dreams. Remember Hotumantua's dream? That's how he left his homeland in Chiba, wherever that was, maybe New Zealand. Dreams are the way future truths are communicated. The peoples of Polynesia believe, as the Mayan Indians believe, that there are good and bad spirits. Not all of them are good. They don't believe, you know, forget the new age. We live in a perfect world. They don't believe that. They don't believe that everything that happens happens for a reason. Sometimes things are screwed up. And they believe that at night, 
your soul goes out to meet all the spirits, and some are malevolent, so you have to have a strong soul power, mana, a strong mana. Dreams are soul travel. Dreams, if you have that strong soul power, the strong mana, then dreams can be like the revelation that Hotumantula had to get out quickly because his islands were going to sink. So they can be prophesied. You take your dreams very, very seriously. It's a great tragedy <coughs> for me that somebody like Sigmund Freud, who was extremely brilliant, was so damn Eurocentric that he refused to look at any cultures outside of Europe. And I'm saying this because I think he did brilliant analyses of dreams in Greco-Roman literature. I wish he would have taken Aztec or Hindu culture seriously as well. Unfortunately, he does not. <coughs> Now let's talk about the ugly side of anthropology. Yeah. So the cute side with Thor Heyerdahl. Now let's get into the ugly side. How many of you remember hearing about Margaret Mead? And back in the day, she was the grand dame of anthropology. And she wrote a book called Blackberry Winter, right? Growing up in Samoa. And every student of anthropology had to read that book. Well, Thor Heyerdahl came out and said, this is crap. <laughs> you know why he said it's crap? Because Thor Heyerdahl had spoken with the people of Samoa, and what she wrote in that book didn't fit what he saw in terms of their cultural practices. When Thor Heyerdahl came, when he went sailing, like a good Viking, all over the Pacific, he found cultures which were quite conservative sexually. Now, Margaret Mead, with all the prejudices of her times, the early part of the 20th century, you know, she saw women with their breasts showing, and she just thought, wow, you know, animal house. <laughs> you have to understand that the breast is not for Pacific cultures. It's not an aphrodisiac. It is not something sexual. And Iredell pointed out, Margaret Mead could only look at that, frankly, with the eyes of an early 20th century Protestant missionary where a breast would be a big deal, but it does not mean anything for the peoples of the Pacific. It's hot. Women walk with their breasts hanging out. Men go around, hey, I see guys. Well, I look close to Mill Avenue. Boy, do I see guys. <laughs> <laughs> now they sure, it's a lot. So, see, that's a custom in Arizona. But men walk around without their shirts. Guys are showing you their chest. Why is it such a big deal when we do it? It does not have a sexual meaning in the Pacific. So Heyerdahl and many other anthropologists of his generation, also a very great one, Claude Levi-Strauss, also said, I don't think Margaret Mead is looking at this with native eyes. She seems to be looking at it with her eyes. Because she wrote that on Samoa, it was just a sex festival. <laughs> and she was trained in Freudian sexuality. And, you know, she was analyzing everything that way. Well, you know if you read Blackberry Winter, you might also see why Heyerdahl read this and just said, and he, being Scandinavian, he was wonderful and had no tact. He just said, this is crap. <laughs> because Heyerdahl said, how? She's believing who her informants? Do any of you know who her informants were? Two 13-year-old girls. People, are you going to believe 13-year-old girls in any culture? No. Don't. 13-year-old girls talk crap. All the time. And they knew what she wanted to hear. Because, you know, Margaret Mead, who came from a rather repressed background sexually, was in the South Sea Islands, and it was just, wow! And they knew she wanted to hear it. They also knew she was in love with the chief of the island. So they told her just what she wanted to hear. And she wrote a book which fits Thor Heyerdahl's description of it. But you know that book was standard reading until the late 1980s. When I started my career, when I began to study my BA, right around that time, I had to read that book. And I read that book and I said, this is crap. <laughs> what has really proven higher dollar rate? Well, Samoan anthropologists later on wrote their version of their culture. And so Margaret Mead has been utterly discredited. But I mention her because you have to understand where anthropology was to higher dollar really flipped it on the head. And all Margaret Mead and her ill were doing was perpet perpetuating ridiculous stereotypes.
So the fire dance, where well, yeah, everybody appears to be, according to as Margaret Mead said, half naked. Well, nudity does not have the wild sexual meaning in the South Pacific, you know, that it appears to invoke in our cultures. It's hot. So your body, if you're going to, you know, freak out every time somebody half nude walks by, you will know. The fire dance is not, as Margaret Mead described it, an expression of sexual desire. It is a prayer to who? Tell me who. What's her name? Hina. Hina. That's all. It is a prayer to the fire goddess Hina. To what? To control the volcanoes so they don't explode. And now we get to crazy things. <laughs> My friend and colleague, Kendra, has an obsession with the shape of the silly continent. <laughs> you don't need drugs when you read James Churchward's book. How many of you have ever heard of the lost continent of the moon? <laughs> Nobody wants to admit it. Everybody's like, I'm not going to say I watched that video on YouTube. <laughs> have any of you ever heard the word Lemuria, the lost continent? In the 1930s, <clears throat> an aristocratic and totally insane English soldier and soldier of fortune named, named James Churchward was actually doing something altruistic. He was doing famine relief work in India. He claimed to have found lost records which he never showed anybody in a language which he never revealed in a Hindu temple whose name he never gave away. It told the story of the motherland of man. Moo. <laughs> Moo. <laughs> Moo, people of Gilbert, people of Gilbert. <laughs> and he wrote no less than eight books about Moo. You know, when Heyerdahl was sailing over the Pacific, Heyerdahl used to get himself through professional problems by drinking a disgusting taste of Norwegian drink called Aquavit. Mm. <laughs> Who here has ever tasted it? It is like drinking tree bark, but he loved it. And Heyerdahl said when the Aquavit ran out on the Contiki boys, he just started reading Churchward's books. <laughs> Churchward was crazy. Okay. What did he do? He, in, well, he took a children's story from Peru. There is a beautiful story that Peruvians tell their children, much the same as you might have told your kids or grandkids or nieces and nephews Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty, about a magical land in the West called Mu, a magical continent that had disappeared, and before it disappeared, it sent its high priests out, and one high priest named Aramuru had come to the Andes and brought a magnificent golden disc, and that was the origin of the Incas sun disk, right? The disk of the sun. People, in Peru, that's a fairy tale. Nobody believes it. How would you respond to somebody who shows up in Phoenix or New York and says, I'm looking for Snow White? <laughs> okay. So he was crazy. He was crazy, but he was apparently crazy but not stupid because he published those books and those books were million sellers, and his story was that this lost continent was not a fairy tale. For the peoples of Peru, it's like the island of Avalon, and you heard of Avalon, mm -hmm. that wonderful mythical. I know I also hold King Arthur exists, but you know, I'm, not, I'm not going to write a book saying I've been to the island of Avalon. He told the story of a continent sinking 100,000 years ago. From this continent, he said, was he influenced by, hey, nobody's even noticed the other wacky <laughs> And from this continent went forth delegations to bring culture to the rest of the world. Now, let me tell you, when you first read the book, okay, church work can be a bit weird because he's playing with certain geological truths. <coughs> the ring of fire, that's all this. And it's a horribly volcanic area. Is it possible that islands sank? Yeah, we know plenty of islands sank. 
But no people of the Pacific have the story of a continent sinking. <coughs> they have constant stories of islands sinking. Something as big as a continent would have been remembered. But you know what throws church word to the doggies? When you read his book, you realize he was a racist. Because what does he say? This is the origin of man, of the three races of man. And the superior race was the white race. And at that point, Heyerdahl apparently took the book and threw it somewhere in the Pacific. Churchill was a man of his time. And he had all the prejudices of a man of his time. But if you have insomnia one night and you go trolling through the internet, you are going to find over a thousand videos about the lost continent of the moon. It is sheer fantasy, but the hold that it has on people's imagination is huge. And yes, Kendra, I think that continent looks stupid. It looks like it looks like a chicken noodle. I'm sorry, it's a stupid chicken. Pele, the fire goddess, we have this idea, Hina, Pele, this similarity of the female fire deity, we find it in Hawaii, we find it in the Rapa Nui, we find it on the island of Crete. Okay, don't forget in the Mediterranean, part of Crete went down. That is probably the origin of the legend of Atlantis. If we ever want to do a totally crazy session here in the Gilbert Library, let's do one on crazy legends of lost mountains. You can see your silly mood. <laughs> Fire is the neutral zone where male and female principles meet. Look at this idea of a woman as power, a woman identified with the fire principle. That's interesting. Usually that's identified with the male principle. In other mythologies, in the Pacific, fire is the female principle. And no, that, that's Kendra being so. <laughs> so when you go to Easter Island, you are not going to see much <laughs> more. But if you want to put that picture on YouTube and write some crazy commentary, like, so these are the survivors of Moo. I'm sure someone will pick it up. But you see, they're waiting because they'd really like you to contribute. So um, I'm going to be, because you see I have the subtlety of a sledgehammer. If any of you would like to give us a little contribution, we do have a contribution box, a little green box over there. We'd be very grateful. And... Um, Kendra, thank you, dear, for your lovely PowerPoint. And you'll be putting this on YouTube, where you should not confuse it with the crazy videos <laughs> on the Lost Continent of Luke. Kendra, how do they get into the, our channel? You just go to youtube.com and search for ACMRS. ACMRS. We have 55 or 60 videos now. Okay, so you have a lot of funny things, fun and funny things to go through. Um, I also want to point out to you, we do have a lovely line of historical fiction called Bagman Books. Take a look at it. Um, yeah, and uh, help us so we can have more of these wonderful lectures. Thank you. Thank you.